What's the most important part of the book for Australians specifically? I'm guessing it's something to do with China and, and the, the uh, division with China as well as China's reopening right now. Well, there's a lot in China on the book. And um, I mean, there's a big there's a big section on Russia and Ukraine. There's a big section on um, the climate scam. Uh, there's a big section. Imagine that might not go over too well in Australia. But, you know, again, it's got 200 footnotes. So um, I'm always open to debate, but go read a lot of the primary sources and you know one can draw your own conclusions but there's a lot on climate change there's a lot on ukraine there's a lot on china um and you know rather than recite it all just if you ask me to put it into kind of one headline um china has uh peaked they're a, a nation in decline um economically uh financially demographically this notion that you know the 20th century was the american century and the 21st century will be the Chinese century. Um, it's just not true. Uh, yeah, China had enormous growth, uh, one of the greatest, longest stretches of compound, you know, double digit compound growth in the history of the world. So that, there's no denying that. But they were rising from low income to middle income. Uh, it's a much tougher deal to get from middle income to high income. They haven't mastered that yet. Very few countries ever have. Um, and it's uh, you, you need a lot more than China has right now. But that failure to make the leap to high income from middle income status comes at the same time that their population has begun a steep decline. And uh, the thing I love about demographics is you can actually uh, um, know exactly uh, how many 40 year olds are going to be 20 years from now because they're all 20 today. I mean, it's it, yeah, there's there's an actual real mortality component, of course, but that's not that hard to figure out. Um, and so demographics is an area where you can do some very long-term forecasting with a high degree of uh, uh, accuracy. And China is on track to lose 600 million people in the next 70 years. By the end of this century, the Chinese population will have dropped from 1.4 billion to perhaps 800 million, maybe even lower. And if a simple, the simplest form of GDP is how many workers do you have and how productive are they? It's just it's like a two-factor model, but it equals nominal GDP. How are you going to run that economy if you're losing 600 million people? Um, and the answer is you'll be lucky to, to survive um, in terms of the regime, but that's just the beginning of it. There are all kinds of consequences. That It gets worse. It's, they're not, only, not only is the population shrinking, but they're getting older at the same time, which is highly correlated with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline. Uh, and the need to assign caregivers to the elderly, which means they can't do other kinds of work that might be more productive. You know, the real estate bubble, um, the 50% of the water in China is poisoned. Uh, Jim, you know, I think we're recording this. We're recording this on the day that India has overtaken China as the highest population country. And then uh, there's a Nikkei Asia headline. Uh, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida says Japan on brink of social dysfunction as births fall. And he's announced a big policy to try and get people to have more kids. So all of this demographics, everyone knew it was coming. And yep. the media, they're all surprised by it. It's, yep. it's quite ironic. Yeah, I had uh, I had lunch in Korea that was a few years ago with uh, the former uh uh, assistant finance minister of Japan, uh, Takashibara. He was known in the eighties as Mr. Yen. He was, he was the, the Yen guy, uh, but you know, distinguished, uh, retired policymaker in Japan. And I said, uh, I said, you know, we all know the demographic situation. Um, you know, you know, China's had nine recessions since 1989, continued depression, deflation, et cetera. Um, and I said, uh, uh, how are you going to get out of this? Or what are you going to do about it? And uh, he said, um, well, what you're missing, uh, Mr. Rickers, is, uh, yeah, we have a lot of declining statistics, but the population is dropping even faster. So on a per capita basis, we're better off. And the truth is, you go to the Ginza and, you know, the lights are on, there's, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the theaters are open, the stores are open, et cetera. So I said, okay, so let's just play out, play this out. So, so 50 years from now, there's one person left in China, but she owns the whole place. Is that kind of what you're saying? I, I don't think you saw the humor in that, but that was, that is the, the, the path that they're on. Uh, but yeah, uh, in terms of wealth, that'll get you through the night, but in terms of output, not so much. Yeah. And, and that the is, debt is the key issue, right? Because if your population halves, well, your GDP per capita might still go up. But the debt burden is, is also distributed amongst less people, so more per person as well. 
unless you have inflation, in which case the real value goes down. So this, we may end up with just some kind of crazy hyperinflationary world. That, that's getting a little further down the road. But you're right. These are these are the kind of outcomes you see when you have these demographic catastrophes. Yeah, I lived in Japan for about a year and a half uh, during COVID. Um, and yeah, the, the standard of living is, is extraordinarily high if you've got the income. Uh, so as a foreigner in Japan, it, it, was, it was like paradise because I was able to afford um, a lot of the, the best of everything. Whereas for the Japanese people, they work incredibly hard for very low wages. So... Um, I didn't see that per capita uh, side play out very much. Let's move on to the solutions. Uh, you've got four in the book. Mention one of them. Um, it's up to you which one, um, and, and we can explore that one. Um, it sounds obvious. People kind of roll their eyes. I say, well, the key is diversification. And people go, well, of course, diversification. Everybody knows that. It reduces risk, increases return, efficient frontier, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but People know that in theory, and it's a cliche, but they don't understand what diversification really is. And when I say that, let me give you an example. I run into people all the time. They go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, consumer, you know, et cetera. Uh, and I look at them, I say, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, but you have one asset class. It's called stocks. And when you don't need protection, there's a, there's a little bit of uh, uh, idiosyncrasy, but when you most need protection, they're highly correlated. They all, in, in stress, they all go down together or they can rally together. But the point is, you're not diversified at all. You're betting on one asset class. So what's real diversification? Real diversification is dividing your portfolio among multiple asset classes. So have some equities. Yeah, I have a slice of equities there. I really uh, recommend um, energy because it's been beat, beaten down by the Green News scam, and yet we're not we're not going to do it without it. I can, if you don't understand anything about physics, you can understand why. Um, and so those stocks are going to perform very well over the long term. Um, uh, certainly, mining and minerals. Um, I you know recently invested in a lithium mine. Uh, I have investments in a gold mine, um, but there's you know, whether strategic metals, precious metals or anything going into electric vehicles. I, I ridiculed the climate change, the climate alarmists, and rightly so. But it doesn't mean that their policies aren't going to prevail. I mean, just because they have really dumb ideas doesn't mean that they're not going to get traction. So, you know, there, I happen to know there's not enough lithium in the world, above ground, below ground, brine, uh, pro, you know, prospects, proven results, whatever. All the lithium in the world is not enough to make more than about... 10%, probably less of the batteries that the greenies claim they're going to produce. So the whole world has electric vehicles, even though they're charging up from coal-fired energy plants. Um, but uh, uh, so lithium is going to go up. Uh, that exploration is going to go up. The whole thing will end, end badly from the electric vehicle point of view, but at least for some years, that demand for lithium is there. Um, uh, yeah, you know, titanium, uh, uh, aluminum, uh uh, other other strategic mass, uh, metals that are necessary for aircraft and a lot of other manufacturing. Um, the the and, irony there is that the, the same green movement has constrained the the mining and therefore the supply of the very resources that they need to make the, the transition happen, which is why the sure. opportunity is in the resources. That's right. Not to mention the battery. Battery life is about eight years. So you're going to be buying a $30,000 battery on your $70,000 Tesla every eight years. You could buy a new car, but but they're going to be buying batteries. Uh, and they, no one will want them used because you got to buy a new battery. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so that's one uh, one sector. Um, Don't give away too much, Jim. We, we've got to convince people to buy the book still. Uh, oh, well, uh, there's a lot more there. Again, I've, I've hit some highlights, but uh, uh, there's there's a lot there. To sum things up, I think the, the idea of the book is that the supply chain crisis has only just begun. There's plenty right. of action yet to come. There's plenty of uh, effects that the supply chain crisis will continue to have, and therefore investors do need to continue to be aware of what the supply chain crisis has done. 2022 is just a taste, um, and the effects will be you know, continuing it and popping up in lots of different ways. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us uh, and everyone at home. Thanks for watching.